Uh, Karen has been uh, associated with Cat Fancy uh, since 1971 when she began uh, breeding pedigreed cats. Uh, over the years, uh, she has worked with a number of breeds, but the Abyssinian Abyssinian, Abyssinian mm -hmm. uh, has been the love of her life for over 40 years. Uh, Karen, however, is an all-breed judge uh, for the Cat Dancers Association as well, and judges at cat shows um, worldwide. Uh, she's also a member of the CFA Foundation's Board of Directors and manages the Feline Historical Museum that is an alliance uh, for that foundation. Uh, and of course, uh, the presentation uh, tonight will give us a brief look at the origins of uh, the domestic cat and expansion throughout the world, as well as take an overview of the Feline Historical Museum uh, and what it has in its collection. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over uh, to Karen to educate us. Thank you. I see you have a microphone here, but chances are I'm not going to need it. Okay. <laughs> so. We thought we'd take a quick look at the history of cats. Cats basically, Egypt. That's what everybody relates to. Uh, their history and their, and their beginnings. Basically, um, you're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And they were used to protect the crops. Once they were harvested, they, they protected the crops. Eventually, people brought them into their houses, and they domesticated them. And once they were domesticated, they started traveling and, and delivering their crops throughout the world, and they took the cats with them, because the cats helped to preserve those crops. So they went on trade routes. Um, they traveled by ship, basically. They protected the crops on the way out to places like India and China and on the way back they protected the silk and they protected the uh, paper manuscripts. Once the cats reached China and Japan, we're talking paper manuscripts that they were shipping back to the uh, Europe area, so they protected those. Of course, once they reached Port of Call, those of y'all know you can't keep cat in one spot. <laughs> so once they reached the Port of Call, they, they go on shore. Once they went on shore, of course, they're going to meet other cats, and then you're starting into little breeding programs. So from China, once they reached China, what they did, rather than go back on the ships, was they followed the Silk Route through Russia. And we can trace cats going through Russia, they go through Mongolia, into Russia, and then into Europe. So you were getting a lot of diversity among the breeding that was going on at the time. So, and you were also getting cats that would stay in one area and you'd get a colony of cats. And when you get a colony of cats, what you're going to get are certain characteristics that start to develop, like they all have white paws, or they're all macro tabbies. So that became exciting as well. Long-haired cats, basically, it started in Iran, Turkey, China, and even Russia. Um, to this day, they still have long-haired cats in the wilds of Siberia, trust me, I've seen them. Um, interbreeding, development of, of cats that looked alike, and the British people started expressing interest in them. It's like, well, we can do this. They were huge dog breeders in Britain at the time, so the cats were actually just an addition to their, their breeding activities. Uh, we did short hairs, too. The Abyssinian War. At the end of the Abyssinian War, there was a cat brought back to England. This is the cat. Her name was Zula. And um, she was basically what we can trace the first Abyssinian back to. We, we can't trace any further back than Zula. And we have records that she competed in a cat show in London in 1871. Siamese, well, it was 1884 before somebody brought one of those back from Thailand. And they brought it back from, from Bangkok. And if you go to Bangkok today, you're not going to see the Siamese running the streets. They're just not there. It's uh, <coughs> a lot of it is myth. But in Thailand, they also have other breeds. They started the Siamese, yes. They, but they also resulted in a breed called the Karat, which is a, a solid blue colored cat. They have the Burmese, which she knows all about. And they have the Kalmani, which is a, a white cat with blue eyes. And to this day, we have only just started to accept the Kalmani as a breed in CFA. In the British area, you got the Manx. And they started on the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man just, they have huge advertising. 
campaigns that are run around the fact that the Max Street started there. It's on their money. It's on pretty well everything that comes out of the Isle of Man. And of course, when, once you have something that you like, and once you have something that you think is special, you want to show it to all your friends. So that's where we started cat shows. They developed cat shows so that they could show off what they were breeding program. This particular illustration is from a December 2nd, 1871 cat show that took place in London, England. Once you get a breeding program in place, you want all those cats that you're breeding to look alike. So you need to set a standard for them. So we have um, illustrators and respected judges from the era that were writing books that would set breed standards for those breeds. So they would tell us what that cat, what that Russian blue should look like, what that Siamese should look like, what the color should be, the shape of the head, where the ears should be, things like that. This particular Persian was born in 1898. Um, it was owned by Mrs. McLaren Morrison, who was in India with her husband, who was uh, part of the British government there when it was a, a territory for Britain. She had him, originally she imported him from Tibet, which is north of India, took him to India, and then took him back to uh, England, where he was used an awful lot as a stud. He was very popular stud, at male at his time. And then we have this one, of course, once people started emigrating to America, they brought their cats with them. <coughs> this particular white Persian came to England, from New, went to New Jersey. Um, his owners became extremely prominent in the early cat fancy. His, uh, the daughter of his owner was the, one of the first registrars of registrations for the Cat Fanciers Association back in 1906. This is one of my favorite pieces. Um, Boston Cat Show, held in 1883. This is the first prize trophy. Um, it's, it's a Victorian pewter nutball, and it's just absolutely spectacular. It's large. It stands about 14 inches high. It's, it's, it's quite a piece. It's got a squirrel on it. I mean, it's a nutball, you know, and I'm thinking, Okay, so it was first prize at a cat show. That doesn't make sense, but whatever. You know, it was the Victorian era. It was a not bowl. That's what they put on their sideboards at the time. So we were quite happy to find that. So once, once the breeding programs all gelled together, they decided they needed to record the pedigrees. They needed registrations of the cats, just like the AKC registered their dogs. They started registering cats. Cat Fanciers Association was formed in 1906. Uh, today, we're the largest registry of pedigree cats in the world. We sponsor about 400 shows each year, and we have our headquarters just down the road in the Lions, or at the corner of Main and Arch. If anybody's looking for us. Like I said, they sponsor 400 shows a year worldwide, anywhere from Russia. Uh, you can go around the globe all the way to Israel, just anywhere in between Asia. China is exceptionally big at the moment. And all the cats that compete score points. And at the end of the year, we give out national awards for uh, cats that have the highest points. This particular cat is a Vermilla. Um, she was spectacular. And she was our best cat last year for the show season. Okay, I'm using the Cat Fanciers Association Foundation. The not for profit foundation. We were formed by the Cat Fanciers Association in 1990. And we started collecting. I mean, our intent was to preserve the history of the cat and the history of the cat fancy. And we started collecting. Like I said, things came in boxes. I mean, so I can relate to things arriving in boxes and boxes and boxes. And we had it all in storage because basically we had no place for a museum. Uh, we had the central office for CFA at the time was in New Jersey and we had several items on display in the museum but for the most part all of our stuff was kept in boxes on the back rooms. In 2010 CFA decided to move to Alliance, Ohio. I still haven't figured out why. Um, <laughs> it boggles my mind. But um, the city of Alliance gave them a very low interest uh, loan, which allowed them to buy the building. 
and uh, that loan has since been paid back and they now own the building home free. It's a spectacular building. It's very, very stately. It's got flat granite on the outside. The inside is like pink marble. It's, I mean, it, it is an exceptionally beautiful building and it's perfect for our opportunity to lease the ground floor and establish a museum so that everything we had in boxes could actually be displayed. I mean, you see the, it used to be the old Midland and Buckeye Federal Savings and Loan, and I still have people that come in that know <laughs> their parents banked there <laughs> when they were kids, so, you know. So this is what it looks like on the inside when we bought the building. Uh, it was still set up to be a bank. You can see the teller's desk is still there. The uh, finance department was on the other side of the glass barriers. We preserved all of that. We, we haven't preserved the teller's desk. It was just too unwieldy. But all of the metal and the glass that's engraved with the Linda Buckeye logo, we preserved all of that. It's been taken out of the museum area, but we do have it in storage. And we renovated. You know, when you move into a building that's uh, 60 years old and hasn't been used for 20 years, you, you find things like this and we had to do renovations and, and it cost a lot of money to do this but eventually by the time we painted we put in fresh carpet we cleaned the travertine uh, all the lights were redone the ceiling fans we left because we thought they were really great little ambiance for us and uh, it, it took a while it took um, let's see, we bought the building in October and we didn't open until June so it took us seven months to do this uh, we tore down a couple of offices at the back of the building and made it into one large library and this is it's beginning to come together we're getting there you know we, we've got everything done our display cases that we bought I mean, we were starting from scratch all we had was stuff in boxes so we were starting from scratch. We had to buy display cases and everything else that went along with it. So they had all arrived and they had nothing in them at the time. These are our boxes. We shipped um, three pallets from Phoenix, Arizona to here. It, uh, it took a while and it took a long time to unpack them all. This is the um, opening of the building today. We had a sign in our parking lot and it this is an old picture of the uh, front of the building. It now says the Cat Fanciers Association on top of the portico. We had an opening day, June 10th, 2011. Uh, City of Alliance closed the street for us and we had an opening ceremony on the front on the street. And we had about 300 people came in. We were still bare bones at the time. Um, we have managed to put some items into the display cabinets. You can see there's no art, limited art on the walls. But we had 300 people who came in and, and were really, really impressed with what we were starting to do. And this is how it looks today. Um, we're really pleased with it. We have a, a wall that's 50 feet long, 17 feet high, that has our artwork on it. And that's just a fraction of the artwork that we have. I have more artwork in storage than is displayed on the walls. Um, you can't very well see the little statue at the very front. That's a bronze of a tabby Persian. And it's a bronze by J. Clayton Bright. Now you may not know J. Clayton Bright, but he does a lot of the um, bronze cows and bronze horses if you drive through Kentucky that are on display at the front of all the uh, kennels and, and the stables, I guess. And he, he's very famous. It's the only cat he's ever done. And it, her name's Pixie. She was donated to us by uh, a cat fancier in Philadelphia. And she's there to be petted by everybody who comes in the door. <laughs> That's what I was told. So one of the first things we did was set up um, some displays. So we have the history of the cat. Basically, we we went through what I've just gone through with you. Um, a little bit more detail with that, uh, you know, includes some photos as well, so it makes it really interesting. And then we have another display called From Fancy Cats to Today's Cat Fancy. So it takes us through the beginning of the breeding of cats and the 
establishment that breeds into what we call the cat fantasy, which is basically like the dog fantasy. It's a showing and exhibiting and breeding of, of pedigree cats. Our collection. We're really proud of our collection. We have artifacts from around the world with the cat fancy. Many from the early, early, early days in England. Um, a lot of them are, are trophies like these, a lot, and those are silver. I mean, I remember the days back in the 70s when you got silver trophies. That, that was what the prizes were, cat shows, and, and heaven forbid you should forget the college show. So what's the trophies nowadays, plastic? Uh, there aren't any. <laughs> there aren't any. You get ribbons, and sometimes even the ribbons are just printed on a computer. They're just a flat piece of paper. It, 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 you know, the when you're showing cats, and, and if, if you do a cat show, you've got maybe 10 t judges at a cat show. Each judge will give out probably 50 rosettes or awards during their show. And we finally decided that purchasing 50 rosettes per ring times 10, that's 500 rosettes, at $3 a piece, that most people take home and throw out, is a total and complete waste of money. Yeah. So we've just gone down to the, the paper rosettes. You're lucky if you get prizes. Okay. Hmm. But this is, this is my Boston trophy. You can see it's engraved, which is really, really special. For us, it says first prize November 19, 1883, Boston Cat Show. And it was awarded to a Mr. A.M. Robinson Jr. Well, we discovered at the Boston Globe that A.M. Robinson Sr. was a state senator for the state of Maine. So we can actually trace this right back. We're really excited about that. And it was for um, best specimen of an Angora cat, which these days is what we call Persians. Well, uh, I just think it's spectacular. We it's also own. Sorry, is it in your museum? It is. Yes, we own it. Mm -hmm. We purchased it. Somebody offered it to us, and mm -hmm. we snapped it right up. In 1895, one of the first organized cat shows after Boston was at Madison Square Garden in May of 1895. Mm -hmm. The winning cat was a Maine Coon cat called Cozy, and this little gem is a silver collar that was awarded to Cozy in 1895. It was found in an antique store in New Jersey and an, um, a jewelry collector purchased it and then offered it to us and we were just absolutely thrilled to get our hands on that. So we have, you know, this, this trophy from the American side of the Atlantic Ocean. This is Cozy. I mean, she even, the trophy and, and the medal even came with a picture of the cat. Huh. And, and amazingly, about six months ago, I had somebody offer me an, an original copy of the show catalog for this 1895 show in pristine condition. Mm. Cost me a fortune that I bought. <laughs> so also in 1895, they're still holding cat shows in England and Scotland and the United Kingdom basically and all of elsewhere throughout uh, Europe. But this is a, a silver medal from the Scottish Cat Club, also in eight, May of 1895. And this was Best Cat at that show. It was a cat named Miss Mary. So, um, so we have trophies for Best Cat. I, I think this is fun. Trophies for Best Cat in May of 1895 on the American side of the Atlantic Ocean and also on the European side of the Atlantic Ocean. Crufts. The Crufts Cat Show. You may have heard of Crufts Dog Shows. They still hold them in England. Um, Crufts Cat Shows that he held, Mr. Crufts held two. He uh, didn't make money at either one and canceled the one that was to be held in 1897. This is a gold coin. It's about that big. Just a little bitsy bitsy thing. Um, engraved. One by the team of, uh, by Mr. Woody Wiss's team. Mr. Woody Wiss owned the cat that's shown on the right, which was a cat called Xenophon. It was a uh, British short hair. And, and we were delighted to be able to put those two items together. We found this in a magazine somewhere. We also have this little Itsy Bitsy Rosette. It's only about six, seven inches high. 
um, from a cat show in 1896 held in England. It's amazing what you can find on eBay sometimes. <laughs> um, the third prize. Fortunately, it's got that little tag on it that tells us what it is. So it was awarded to a Manx, owned by uh, Mr. Reynolds and Hadley of the United Kingdom. The Siamese Cat Club. This is an undated medal, but the Siamese Cat Club in England was formed in 1901. And this one is a grade one by best adult. So we know it's an early, early medal from that era. This one excites me too. I found this one on eBay as well. Uh, silver chalice. It's about that high. Engraved. Um, it's the Don Pedro of Thorpe trophy. And we're all like, who's Don Pedro of Thorpe? So we're looking through magazines doing research one day and came across this little picture of this silver tabby Persian. And the caption underneath says, Don Pedro of Thorpe. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this works. So, you know, this is, uh, this is an exceptional trophy. Mm -hmm. But again, it's silver. And I can't leave out Canada, of course. Um, Canadian National Exhibition, which is held in Toronto every year, um, always has a cap show in conjunction with their agricultural shows. And they uh, have been managed by a, a number of clubs and associations over the years. But this little gem um, is from the 19th Twenty-seven cap show at the CNE. We found registration records. Somebody must have gone searching in somebody's attic somewhere and found a box full of CFA registration papers from the early 1900s. These particular ones are 1910 and 1912. Um, and he piecemealed the whole box out piece by piece on eBay. And I offered him a considerable amount of money for the entire box and he said no he was going to sell them individually so we bought them individually oh. <laughs> you know it was like it, it's too good to pass off you, you you don't come across this very often at all but these are handwritten um, that white Persian I mentioned that came from England over to Britain to uh, New Jersey was owned by Mrs. Champion's mother and she was the registrar that hand wrote all of these registrations so we're tying it all together eventually. This is our art wall. Um, we rotated as much as possible. The person who decided how to hang the art um, made it very difficult to rotate it. it, it, it there's a track along the top of the wall and then there's like skewers that come down and hold two or three pieces of artwork. Well, the skewers aren't attached, they're loose. So anytime you move one picture, the other two go crooked. So I, once in a while I get brave and I, I do a whole section of one and uh, rotate our art around. But we have tons of original art. Um, the pictures that you really can't see very clearly on the right-hand side are Panamanian molas that are uh, sewn by the Kuna Indians in Panama. The women sew them to put them, they use them as designs on their blouses and their skirts, and when they're finished with them, they cut them off and they uh, sell them to the tourist trade. Um, they do make some that are specifically for the tourist period. You can tell if these have been um, worn because they, they show signs of wear and, and dirt. So these are all originals that um, we were quite happy to have donated to us. Lewis Wayne artwork. I don't know if anybody's heard of Lewis Wayne. Um, he was born in 1860, died in 1939. He was exceptionally prolific at drawing and painting of cats. He liked to paint them doing things that people do. So they're dressed up in clothes and doing things like playing golf and flying airplanes and things like that. But he produced thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of his work, none of which he copyrighted, which it was much to his detriment. Um, this is an original watercolor that we have that uh, dates from the early 1900s. It's called Where's That Bird? And, and we were quite happy. When it came, uh, it was in a frame, and we knew we had to take it out of the frame and have it reframed and, and preserved. And when we opened it up, it's like, Where's that bird's written on the back of it? We're quite excited to find the title of it. 
This piece is a white Persian. I love the frame. I think the frame on this is spectacular. The white Persian itself, I, I again saw this on eBay and thought, I don't care if I know who this cat is or not, I have to have it. It's just absolutely spectacular, just the artwork and the fact that it, it's obviously old. And then I'm browsing through magazines one day and I'm going, oh, I recognize that cat. This is a 1914 magazine. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, well now we're dating it. Mm -hmm. And it has a caption underneath with the name of the cat. So, I'm going to introduce you to Kilravak, Don Giovanni. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the white Persian male born in 1908. Huh. Um, the painting itself is by Harriet Furness, who was a well known animal painter and photographer in New York City. And I have several other of her uh, photographs that she's done. I actually, I had somebody call me a couple of weeks ago to say that he had an old cat photo. Was I interested in it? And I thought, oh, what the heck? You know, if you want twenty-five dollars, I sent him twenty-five dollars, and this thing arrived. And it is a painting of a no, it's a photograph of a Persian. On the back is the name of the cat. So we can identify it, we can go back to the pedigree and find out all the information about it. <coughs> but it's a photograph by Harriet Furness, mm -hmm. which we thought was just absolutely $25 well spent. Then there's Chessie. Now I'm sure we've all seen the Chessie logo on the railroad cars that trundle through this area. Um, Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad ran between Ohio and Baltimore, Maryland. And it's collectible, very collectible. The railroad people just love them. Um, you, you can see the Chessie outline on the... It was designed in 1930. The top right-hand piece is a calendar from 1949. The bottom one is a calendar from 1953. Now, Chessie was used from maybe 1930 through the 1970s into the 1980s. Uh, during the war years, during the Second World War, they um, introduced a male cat that they called Peak. And Peak was used to help raise money through war bonds. I mean, I, I try to get more chessy stuff, but the railroad people know fit me all the time. I've got more money than I do. We have figurines. I have tons of figurines. Um, I have like six or seven display cases filled with figurines. But we have some really neat old pieces. The cat with the pipe, I think, is spectacular. <laughs> it's undated. It is not signed, but I just love it. The white cat is Aus from Austria. And it's dated about 19, the early 1900s anyway. Pussy is a Royal Dalton piece on the right-hand side. And we've done a lot of research on this Royal Dalton piece, and it, it appears that there's only five of them left in the world. So this, this is a piece that probably will sell at auction for between ten and twelve thousand dollars. This is one of my favorite pieces. This is a Chinese roof tile. If you go to China, the roofs are ceramic. They have ceramic tile, curved ceramic tiles, and on the peaks of the the roof, they have decorations. And this is one that was the, would have been a row of them. But you've got this warrior riding a cat. He obviously is missing whatever was in his hands, probably spears of some sort, and they were probably made of wood at the time. But we can date this back to about 1600 AD. Wow. So I, I just, the color on it, is, it looks a little yellow there. It's, it's spectacular. And then we have Maneki Nekos. Now you all know what Maneki Nekos are. They're the Japanese welcoming cat. You see them on the counter of tons of stores and Japanese restaurants, Chinese restaurants. Um, they you the hand, you're supposed to rub the head on top of the head. Buddha had blessed that cat. Did he? Yes. 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 Good for Buddha. The great Buddha around yelling for something to eat. Uh -huh. And Buddha said, if you're that hungry, I'll bless you with the fish. <laughs> there you go. That works. And they all have a paw raised. One signifies wealth, one signifies health. They come in a variety. There's hundreds of different designs and decorations. I probably have 250 of them in the museum. What we did was we decided we would have a special collection room 
and we would rotate. And the Manecki Neckles were going to be our first display in the special collection room. It's turned out to be so popular, I can't take them down. So six years later, it's still there. And I have a woman driving up from Texas in October, and she is donating her entire collection of Manecki Neckles. So we'll probably double the numbers that we have. So. And they're all donated. Where do they manufacture that? Pardon? Where will they manufacture that? Um, the original ones were manufactured in kilns in Japan. Japan. Yeah. And I, and I do have some that come from Japan that are originals. Oh, um, yeah, you're going to get some. Like the one on the, on the left-hand side is a, it's a tin um, piggy bank. You know, so we know that's not made in Japan. But it's, it's just cute. It falls in with the collection. So we added it. <laughs> we are cat dolls. I have 225 cat dolls. Uh, one of the advantages of having the, the old bank building as our museum is that we have a vault. Uh, we have the door chained open. I mean, the door is like yay thick. But we have a vault. So um, my cat doll collection is inside the vault. That way the sun doesn't get out their clothes. It doesn't fade them at all. And we have a huge, huge collection. They were, for the most part, donated by someone in Hawaii who's been a cat collector for ages. And she just uh, kept sending them to us. And there's all different kinds of them. So. <laughs> They're cute. Some, some of them are a bit freaky. Like that one. <laughs> it, you don't know how many people ask me if that one's real. It's, it's, it's a French marionette. And uh, the hits still got mohair sewn on it, so it looks so so much like like we have a Frank Lloyd Wright piece. Mm. It came from uh, a house that Mr. Wright did in Cincinnati, and the couple's daughter wanted a cat house for her cat, so uh. Frank Lloyd Wright designed one for her, and that's it. It's in the signature Cherokee red, and we even have the art. More importantly than the piece itself, we have the artwork, the design artwork for that piece. So. And it's just oh. about big enough for this main coon. <laughs> just oh. about. Oh. It's good. We have a teapot collection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Maybe 50 or 60 teapots all on cats. <laughs> we have cookie jars as well. well another 50 or 60 cookie jars all different varieties of different uh, eras. <laughs> Our library. Uh, started out with 700 books where he had tons of estate books collected and we now have mm, 7,500. All, all on the topic of cat. The Glendale Museum in Glendale, California, which is a Los Angeles suburb, used to have a cat collection room. And what they did was they decided that they needed the space to have a Glendale City collection room and they needed a home for all of their collection so they very nicely shipped me 96 boxes of books. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. like, thank you very much, Glendale. One of the exciting things in our uh, library is this scrapbook by Samuel Perkins. Samuel Perkins used to be the commissioner for the erection of public buildings in the city of Philadelphia. And he was the person responsible for the erection of Philadelphia City Hall. But he also liked cats. This scrapbook I found at a, a cat show in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it is filled with cut out articles on cats, each of them hand dated by Mr. Perkins, and it dates from 1860 to 1895. So, I mean, the history of the cat that, that's located in those articles is just magnificent. And he liked cats so much that when he did build the Philadelphia City Hall, his eight cats are all in freezes around the Hall of Justice walls. Mm. Wow. So. We have a children's library. A gentleman in Florida donated 1,500 children's books, so we dedicated one of our rooms on the mezzanine library, on the mezzanine level, to a children's library. The artwork on the walls is from an 1895 uh, book by Louis Wayne, so that's all his artwork as well. <coughs> have an entire room dedicated to magazines. They date back as early as 1909. The Green Magazine, 
that little cat is called Sally, and Sally was owned by someone who actually lived in Alliance, Ohio, in 1936. So it, it, it's nice to be able to tie all this stuff into local history as well. I have a lot of breed specific information. These were all Berman pedigrees sent to me by somebody in England. We do breed presentations, quick changeabouts in the rooms so every six months. This was our Persian breed presentation. We also did one on Siamese, which worked out very well as well, because it's always a popular breed. Every once in a while, we bring cats, live cats, into the museum, usually in the summer when the kids are off school, and we let them play. We let them run around. Um, they have their little tents if they want to be comfortable and um, have a rest from all the kids, but. Oh, this one decided it was going to sit in the 1920s cat carrier or a Japanese bobtail. But the kids come in and they play with them. Sometimes parents can't get them out. <laughs> you know, we let these, these little Maine Coon kittens, we bring them in at about between three or four months and we socialize them. I mean, they come from a breeder, so they're going to be socialized anyhow, but they're bomb proof by the time they've left my museum. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> This little rag doll just decided to go make himself at home on my desk and that was all there was to it. There was no budget now. Or he could take a nap in the library, you know, depending on what his mood was that day. Yeah. Yeah. We even have dogs. This is a, they came in the day we had agility in a museum and uh, she was a guide dog. She was absolutely the most gentle dog I've ever seen and she was just superb with what she did. You can't see the agility. The agility, uh, you, you know the dogs run agility courses. Well, we do it with cats too. <laughs> and, and they can do it. They can set up an agility course and cats can go around it as fast as seven seconds. And at this point, we, didn't, we couldn't decide whether the kids were playing agility with the cats. But, you know, they, they were all having the kids come in, they have fun. And that's the main thing. We get down the floor and they crawl around with these cats. And these cats are fearless. I mean, they, they just don't care. They'll just play with is anybody. A, is the little girl dressed in a cat suit? She is. That's what I thought you had Yeah, she is. <laughs> she, but she's the daughter of one of our uh, employees upstairs. This guy thinks he's fishing, uh, playing with the cat. That's okay, too. They have fun. Oh, look at that one. I don't know if you, what kind of problems you have with your carpets in your museums, but... Um, this is my barometer for when my carpets need cleaning. You let a cat with white paws run around in your carpets, they end up looking like that. And we go, okay, time to clean carpets. We have a Rainbow Bridge area, a memorial book for cats that have passed on and are waiting at the Rainbow Bridge for their owners to join them. So that's just an extra special little corner. The cat itself came from... Uh, New York State. I can't remember the name of it. Catskills. The city of the Catskills has a uh, competition every year. They give blank cat figurines to artists and they design whatever they want and they display them for the whole year mm -hmm. and then they auction them off as a fundraiser. And we couldn't resist this one. It was just he's big. We are open in the museum to hosting receptions. Um, we do best at stand-up receptions and walk around. This one was catered by the Mount Union University catering people, and they did a phenomenal job. We have wine and cheese parties every once in a while, too, and we rent out space for that. We're all about history. So we basically developed a website for, called The History Project, and it contains Oh, well, probably stories, individual stories, about 350 cats that we can trace back to the early, early 1900s and the late 1800s. And, uh, you know, it, it depends what you want to read about. You can find it there, all different breeds. This is our gallery, just headshots of the cats that we can find pictures of dating back to the early 1860s. These are people involved, again, people related to the cat fancy and involved in the cat fancy. A lot of them are British and we trace those back again to the early 1900s as well. These are our rat cards. Um, we decided we were going to make it interesting. We developed a whole series of rat cards using breeders with their cats. 
parcel and uh, they basically turned into collector's items. We have feline portraits, tons of pictures. I mean, we are just picture heaven here. We have people portraits and we work with the Harris of Weir collection. The Harris of Weir collection is located in New Zealand and uh, he's, he's been exceptionally good at locating photographs and things like that. So we're on social media. You can visit us on, of course, Facebook. Mm -hmm. We have our own website and uh, I think that just about covers it. That's mm -hmm. my cat. Oh. So that's you know, just a brief look at what we have. We have a lot more to us and, and two storage units full of boxes as well. So uh, I hope you can manage to find your way down and see what else we've got. And I thank you all very much for inviting me. What's your cat's name? Her name is Curlamity Jane. <laughs> because she's an American curl, so you can see her ears curl back at the uh, tips. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the Main Street Ring Museum is that's downtown in the old. Downtown, section. yeah. It's at the corner of Main and Arch. It's really close to the Spectrum store and the Troll Museum. It is. Right. Yeah. Museum. We're across right the right parking next. lot from the Troll Museum. And if you haven't been there, you really need to go. It's a wonderful collection. And uh, very easy to get around. Not too much, not too much stairs to deal with. And no, yeah, but basically everything's on the ground floor. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you saw the big room, but there's lots of little rooms <coughs> off. Okay. Yeah. So that you don't see. Or the admission? No, there's no, no admission. admission. We we take donations, but there is no admission oh. fee. What are your hours? We are open Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 4, and Saturday, 9 till noon. Thank you. I sure have brochures. How do you support it? And do you have fundraisers? You have um, donations. The, pretty well everything in the museum is donated. There's some things on loan, but pretty well everything is donated. The uh, items that were donated from a major estate also came with a. Um, financial donation of about a million dollars which allowed us to set this up in the first place so we've invested that money and, and we work off the income on the investments. So that's how you pay your electric and cleaning and everything? Well actually just we pay rent for the building and which CFA itself owns and our utilities are all included in the rent so we don't have those added expenses but just and the rent. And if you go over, you'll see Karen because her office is right inside the door. Right, <laughs> that's where I am. In. Mm -hmm. She's right there. So, where are you from originally? Originally, I was born in England. Okay. Um, and my parents emigrated to Canada, and, and Canada is my home. Okay. Um, so I'm Canadian. I work here. I have work visa. I'm not an illegal immigrant. <laughs> I do have a work visa. Uh -huh. And uh, so yeah, transfer to Alliance, Ohio. Worldwide organization. Any other questions for Karen? Yeah, I have a question. I love watching the dog shows on TV, especially you know, right after Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. after the Thanksgiving break. Do they ever have cat shows on TV? Like you're talking about? For the most part, no. No. Okay. Only because it's it's too noisy in the background. Oh. And and it's just busy because when you go to a dog show, they have one ring. Yeah. yeah. We have like 16 running at once. Mm -hmm. There is a huge cat show coming up at the IX Center on the 13th, 14th of October. Mm -hmm. uh, they're expecting a thousand entries that are going to fly Where in from around the, the world. Where is that? The IX Center is in Cleveland. It's oh, Cleveland. By the airport. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I do have brochures in the, the museum about it, so if anybody was interested. Is there a breed of polydactyls? Um, we don't recognize the breed as polydactyls. We recognize the polydactyl gene as a, um, it's a, it's a genetic fault. If we have one. Oh, uh, they're fairly common. 
Yeah. I mean, it's one of those genes. Once it's there, you don't get rid of it. It's recessive. It comes out once in a while. Hemingway. The Hemingway. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It's not. It's not a fault you're going to find in the majority of pedigree cats. Now, do they have? The extra claw in the back too, or is this cat is in the front? For the most part, it's in the front. But I mean, they can have up to like ten toes on the, each front paw, They're like catcher smiths. One that's almost eighteen pounds and has six, six toes on each toe. Off of individually, <coughs> you make more or less money selling them that way than you buy them. He made more money. Did he? Yes, a lot more. That was why he was selling them individually. And, and the post office made a lot of money too. Yeah. Every time you bought one, he, he mailed them individually. I mean, I could have shot him. <laughs> so he was sitting on this treasure trove and he knew it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Make sure to visit the Cat Fancy uh, or Feline Historical Museum um, and help yourself to some treats. And we'll blame David Shivers for the cat. Um, cat. Oh, yeah. Your box cake. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have to taste this. He says it's good. My cat, she's tan now. Yeah. All right, thank you. She's nice a brown patch tabby. Has there ever been a male in a cow that was so certain that was? They're very rare. You do get them, but they...